this inside Christian culture, there was a different level of shame around really, honestly, like just acknowledging that you had limits as a human. Mm -hmm. Um, And what's so crazy about this idea that we want to live without limits is that our friend and savior Jesus, when he came to earth, took on limitations and boundaries and, and borders of humanity so that he could relate to us. And we want to spend the rest of our lives saying like, I don't have to sleep. I don't have to do this. I don't need rest. And, and he spends his, you know, three years of really essential ministry, obviously loving and obviously serving and obviously being overly um, generous and kind and just, and supernaturally on other people's team. And also he rests. And also there's 41 recorded times in the, New, in the New Testament that we see him pulling away to be alone or to rest. Welcome to the Living Wholehearted Podcast, helping leaders live with integrity. You know that moment where you're asking everyone, hey, how are you doing? And they say, fine, tired, busy. You know, I kind of always am shocked if someone's like, I'm doing great. I feel so rested. I've had just an amazing day. In fact, I'm always pausing going, tell me more. Because so often in our culture, we just automatically revert to this pace and this race and this constant being tired, not sleeping, go, go, go. And it's the treadmill of life living, particularly in Western culture and Western Christianity. Uh, Rest doesn't feel like a norm for many. It's a spiritual discipline, and it's something that we have to learn, we have to teach, and we have to experience. So today we have a really special guest, Jess Connolly. She is the author of many books. I think she said about 13 or 12 at this point, but uh, some of her my favorites are Wild and Free and Breaking Free from Body Shame. Her most recent book is Tired of Being Tired. Receiving God's Realistic Rest for Your Soul Deep Exhaustion. Love that title. And so we um, are so glad to have her with us. She is married and has four kids um, and has planted the church, Bright City Church in Charleston, South Carolina. It's so good to have her with us today. Well, Jess, it's so good to have you with us today. Uh, We usually start every interview with a bit about um, our guest and their story As leaders and the call in our life, our story really impacts what we do and why we do what we do. So help us understand a little bit about the backdrop of your own journey, Um, maybe some highlights, highs and lows about how you got here today. I love this question. Yeah, I think I think it really matters. And it it, it it's so good to unpack for all leaders like, hey, here's how we landed here. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, my story starts when I met Jesus. I met Jesus when I was 15. And I probably if I'd had the language for it, I could have told you within the first 24 hours that I was going to be in ministry for the rest of my life. I immediately knew I wanted to teach the word. I immediately knew I just I just was obsessed with helping other people experience the love and the kindness and the power of God. And I just, I kind of like, couldn't get over like, mm. we can talk to God. We, we can do this. <laughs> um, and a lot of days on my best days, I still feel like that 15 year old girl. Um, I met my husband within a year of meeting Jesus and, and he was kind of the same way. And so we were like, let's do this. Let's spend our whole lives in ministry. And of course that has taken us through some very, very high highs and some very low lows and different like breaks and twists and turns. Um, but for the most part, we've been in church ministry since our late teens. I, I first went on staff at a church when I was 19 and I've been serving in a church ever since. Um, and about 15 years ago, I kind of made the the shift from being a mommy blogger to being um, a published author and started writing books. I've now written over 12 traditionally published books. I run an organization called Go and Tell Gals, and we coach women in their calling. So we end up specifically coaching a lot of women in ministry, a lot of authors and communicators and um, podcasters. And so that's my day job. Mm-hmm. And by the grace of God, I also get to lead at Bright City Church here with my husband that we planted 10 years ago. So a lot of ministry, a lot of mission, a lot of family, a lot of fun, and a lot of messes along the way. But 
um, that's kind of my leadership journey in a nutshell. Hmm. I love it because it's pretty much giving us the framework of your latest book, <laughs> Tired of Being Tired. <laughs> yeah. When you name off all the titles yeah. and all the roles that you're holding, that many of us hold, especially as high capacity leaders, um, it yeah. just is exhausting just hearing the list sometimes of the things that we're doing. And yet the joy I hear yeah. from that 15 year old girl of like, here's my why yeah. um, and getting in touch with that. Yeah. So talk a little bit about this this um, idea of rest and your journey to being like, you know what, I'm sick and tired of being tired and saying that's the thing that I tell everybody or we hear from one another. Yeah. I mean, I, that's why I love that you asked about like, okay, give me the landscape of your leadership. Because when I started writing Tired of Being Tired and I started talking about it and doing interviews, I, I think somewhere along the way, somebody asked me the question, like, when did you first really feel tired? And that made me do some introspection. And I was like, when did I first really feel tired? When did I feel so significantly tired that it was like a way of life for me? And it was college, interestingly, which was Mm -hmm. when I had my very first ministry job, my very first uh, job on staff at a church. And um, I don't think those two are as closely linked necessarily as more like this kind of culture that I subscribe to, I, I believe for me in college is when I really started to kind of summarize or ascertain, okay, this is what it looks like to be a woman who lives on mission, who serves, who loves, who's generous, who's kind, who's a good leader. And I was paying attention to the culture around me, kind of describing or showing me what was good and admirable and lovely. And I was willing to push past my own boundaries and borders to fit that mold. Um, to be what other people would think a Christ follower should look like or a leader should look like or a woman of God should look like. And I tried really hard to the glory of God, hopefully to live into that for about two decades um, until for me, it landed me in a mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical breakdown. And so in early 2022, I had a breakdown that had probably been brewing for a couple of years at that point. Um, But I began to struggle with stress to the point of um, extreme exhaustion and um, insomnia and panic attacks. And my body started to break down. I had an autoimmune disease and I was having just like flare up after flare up after flare up, getting Mm -hmm. sick over and over and over again. And emotionally and spiritually, I just I, I had a very hard time being present and getting through the day. Um, And so, yeah, I I. I wish that I went, I sat somewhere quiet in a sweet room and thought, I'm so good at rest. I want to tell everybody about being, being, you know, good at rest too. But instead for me, the journey to writing tired of being tired was I got so tired. I just broke. Yeah. And that's many people's journey. I mean, the ambition and the zeal of our youth carries us only so far. (laughs) And then, but yeah. then you're speaking about the yeah. cultural discipleship, um, I remember just a woman flat out just telling me, we'll get to rest in heaven. So you, you run Ooh. your race. And I was like, yeah, you know, I was game for that. And now I'm yeah. like, wow, yeah. that's the kind of um, thinking that gets us burned out, the moral failures, the we're out no more. So talk about the cultural voices um, between healthy kind of faith and this toxic messaging that we somehow align with Jesus. Yeah. I mean, what's crazy is that it's not that people outside of the church are all amazing at rest and that none of them are tired. I mean, obviously, um, secular culture has its own struggles with striving and with hustle. But I began to notice inside Christian culture, there was a different level of shame around really, honestly, like just acknowledging that you had limits as a human. Mm -hmm. Um, And what's so crazy about this idea that we want to live with without limits is that our friend and savior Jesus, when he came to earth, took on limitations and boundaries and, and borders of humanity so that he could relate to us. And we want to spend the rest of our lives saying like, I don't have to sleep. I don't have to do this. I don't need rest. And, and he spends his, you know, three years of really essential ministry obviously loving and obviously serving and obviously being overly um, generous and kind and just, and supernaturally on other people's team. Mm -hmm. And also he rests. And also there's 
41 recorded times in the New, in the New Testament that we see him pulling away to be alone or to rest. Um, and with a lot of those times detailing people waiting for him or people wanting something for him, him or even people needing something from him. Um, and so it's so interesting to me that like inside the church, we see rest as lazy or maybe not loving um, or I don't know. There's just a million different little connotations we put around it, but at the root of it, all of those are, are actually like pretty prideful. Um, and so I think we have a choice, like, do we want to keep agreeing with that culture or do we maybe want to come into a more kingdom minded pace? Mm. I love it. And just, you know, my backdrop is a trauma therapist. And so I'm mm. often dealing, um, I don't do that as much anymore after 20 years. I'm actually more on the coaching side like you yeah. and, and helping leaders yeah. really evaluate. But there's often signs that are pretty early on that we ignore. You said push past yeah. and we, we, we don't pay yeah. attention to. So let's talk about those signs, you know, before 2022, when <laughs> you finally yeah. really hit the wall. What were some of those earlier yeah. pieces before the panic attacks that maybe can cue us in yeah. for those that don't have to wait till they hit the, the end all crash? Yeah. So for me, if I, it's easiest for me to kind of walk through them through spiritual, physical, mental, and emotional. So some of the spiritual signs for me that I needed, um, that I needed more rest, that I needed more than I was getting um, were things like feeling bitter feeling better that people were taking my time, feeling better that pe other people were doing better than I was, a lack of compassion. Like, honestly, I think a lot of us are, mm -hmm. are beating ourselves up because we're not experiencing compassion or even joy. And we're like, oh, I just really need to work on my compassion and my joy. The truth is we are probably lacking compassion and joy because we're exhausted, <laughs> because we're not having our own spiritual needs met. Um, and so those were some of the early signs for me. Again, they weren't like crazy. It wasn't wild sin. You know, it wasn't like hidden secrets. It was just like, Somebody would ask me to pray for something and I would think like, no, that's not even a big deal, you know, <laughs> or like, sure. But like, who's going to pray for me? That was my honest yeah. inner dialogue, you know? Yeah. And I, th I think a lot of times when we see ourselves or we feel ourselves thinking something like that or feeling something like that, number one, maybe we don't think anything of it because it's just inside our minds. We would never say it outside. Number two, we might beat ourselves up about it and gaslight ourselves and say like, no, you just get better. Feel, don't, don't talk like that. But there's actually something behind that. So those were some of the, the spiritual signs for me. Some of the physical signs um, were, I, I always used to say like, I'm just a bad sleeper. I'm just not a great sleeper. I'm the kind of person who I get up really early. I actually, both my husband and I would have, would say that there were times in our life that we, we were like really proud of the fact that we were both really early risers. Um, and now I realized I was an early riser because I was so burnt out. My body could not sleep. I couldn't sleep past 4.50 in the morning. Um, my body couldn't do it because I was at such a place of adrenal fatigue and uh, just exhaustion that my body was so wired I had to get up and get started. Um, so those were some of the ones for, for physical fatigue. I would say mental fatigue for me looked like brain fog. It looked like a lack of passion, um, never really feeling super present. I'd get through some big event or a wedding or a trip or a ministry event. Um, and I would think like the pictures of this look beautiful, but I don't remember a lot of it or I didn't mm -hmm. experience a lot of it. Um, and that was a, that was a big warning sign for me. And then I would say emotionally, my, my big two that I think a lot of women and honestly, a lot of men can relate to is that I would swing from one side to the other. And that was either I couldn't emote. Um, and again, looking back into, in hindsight, that was something I was really proud of. If I could make mm -hmm. it through a funeral without crying, if I could make it through a tough or a tense meeting without tearing mm -hmm. up, but staying very calm. Um, mm -hmm. If I could get through a hard conversation, maybe somebody confronting me or somebody addressing some sin in my life. And I could say like, yes, you're right. Okay. I'll work on that um, without emoting. But of course, then I would often swing to the other side of not being able to control my emotions of saying like, I'm, I don't know why I'm crying. I'm just tired. I can't, I can't, I don't know. Everything's fine. Or, you know, blowing up on my kids when maybe they had not done anything wrong. So those are some of the like early warning signs for me, which again, it's messy because a lot of those we praise. They're, they're actually things that we should be cautious about, but they're things that in our culture we've grown to see as a badge of honor. That's right. And the, and the church has adapted that. And we call that, um, yeah 
compartmentalization, you know, when you're living apart from your heart, your mind and your body and your yeah. soul in, in order to survive, which is actually a trauma. It's an adapted trauma yeah. coping strategy. Yeah. And so when you think of it that way, yeah. you go, wow, God didn't design us to just, you know, right. suffer through hard without feeling and processing. Um, but as you mm. were sharing, I'm thinking about a lot of women who have a lot of children. You've got four yourself. I only have two. I say only because they're, and I two remember. Is, two is 20, as my mom says. <laughs> well, I, I birth a lot of other things in terms of uh, the way yeah. that I care for people. But I, I would say that I remember having littles and listening to the older women and they were talking about, you know, having their hour long quiet time and waking up at, you know, 8.30 a.m. And you're just thinking, good for you. But, you know, so let's talk Must about nice. when is this a season? <laughs> because this is life yeah. of being a mom. And if you're working outside the home and all these things, and when is this like yeah. warning, we need to, to really address this yeah. sooner than later. Let's talk about that. Well, here, here are my thoughts. First of all, I, I think anytime we're seeing warning signs in our life of fatigue, I, I actually don't think we ever like press the mute button on it. I don't think we ever say like, this is no big deal. It's just a season. Um, and, mm -hmm. and again, that's probably part, partially what led me mm -hmm. to a breakdown is, um, is motherhood alone. I had three kids under three, um, for the, my, my first few years of motherhood. And then I had a four-year-old and three-year-old and two-year-old, then a three, four and a five-year-old. And I can remember the, the two times that I struggled with postpartum depression, um, going to people, going to professionals and saying like, I don't think I'm doing okay. And hearing people say to me like, I don't know, you're just tired. Um, yeah. And instead of somebody even saying like, maybe number one, you are very tired, but that doesn't mean we just succumb to it. Um, mm -hmm. and it, and it doesn't mean we let it fester to the point where it, it begins to harm you. Um, and so what I would say to anyone, not just mothers with little kids or people in a season, maybe where they're even like caring for an aging parent or mm -hmm. in the middle of a medical crisis or in grad school, um, I would say noticing what kind of fatigue you have, what type, whether it's spiritual, mental, physical, and emotional, I would say, number one, don't assume that you cannot receive little realistic sips of rest, even in your season. Um, and number two, I would say if you can't rest in one of the areas, for example, let's say you have small kids at home, nobody's sleeping through the night, you're physically taking care of them. This might not be a season for you to go full on with physical rest, but how can you experience spiritual, mental, and mm -hmm. emotional rest? um, in, in ways to kind of compensate. And, and I would say like, again, we see this to be true in motherhood, but I think it's really true for all people, women and men. Um, a lot of times what is the core fatigue in our season is our, is what's happening, like what we have to carry, but we usually often volunteer for the fatigues that exacerbate us to the point of, of not being able to keep going. Um, so for example, if I was going to rest coach a young mom, I might say like, listen, you're not sleeping through the night. You're changing a lot of diapers. You're making a ton of meals. All of that is real. You can't stop doing any of that. Do you have to have the extreme elaborate birthday party? Is that maybe a fatigue that you are signing up for, that is cultural, it's not kingdom. Um, and what are all the little things like that that you might be kind of volunteering for that are making the core fatigue of your calling seem so much greater? Mm, that's so good, Jess, because so often we think we've got to have it look a certain way. And we have these ideas that are unrealistic when you're bringing it down to where am I at in the season and what is God calling me to you? Um, and what are the different yeah. kinds of rest I can lean into? So you're talking physical, emotional, soul uh, rest. Talk a little bit more mm -hmm. about what does rest look like? Um, give more examples of how we can kind of start this process of inviting rest into our lives. Yeah, absolutely. So in Tired of Being Tired, there's actually a, a chapter called Find Your Fatigue. So I think First, because because in different seasons, we're experiencing different kinds of fatigue. I think it's really helpful to know which one is most plaguing for you right now. What kind of tired is really like about to take you out in this season? And then I think instead of 
skipping toward kind of these like bigger ideas of rest that a lot of us kind of idolize about either like a vacation or a sabbatical or um, a lot of times when we imagine rest and when we discount ourselves from it, we're actually picturing leisure, which is definitely not the same thing as rest and, and often will not renew our souls. So some some types of like different, really realistic types of rest for the different kinds. I would say like, for example, a, a version of spiritual rest might be um, if you're at a place of spiritual fatigue, like switch up the way you spend time with the Lord. Maybe do listen to the Bible instead of reading it. Um, maybe take a break from in-depth Bible study and read a devotional for a little bit. Um, maybe go on walks with the Lord and talk out loud to him. If all of that feels too taxing, maybe pray while you're cleaning up the toys in the living room and let that be enough. And remember that all of these spiritual disciplines are actually for you. They're not something God wants from you. Um, some tips about physical rest would be, of course, getting more sleep. I'm pretty much convinced that no one in America gets enough sleep. And I think we're all great at waking up. Not all of us, but a lot of us are great at waking up and starting the day and working, working, working. Um, but being really intentional about how we go to sleep, having an having like a rhythmic and healthy bedtime routine it can be life changing for a lot of us. Um, so getting more physical rest, but also taking three minutes to sit out in the sun um, when we're feeling overwhelmed or when our bodies are feeling fatigued, fatigued. I also often say like, I just want to treat myself like a really nice house plant. You know, I want to make sure I get watered and I want to make sure I get sunlight. I want to make sure I get my leaves cleaned off every once in a while. Um, some tips for mental rest would be doing things like a brain dump, taking out a sheet of paper when you're feeling overwhelmed, writing down, capturing everything that's feeling heavy for you, um, turning off your phone. Again, I, I know that most Americans don't know this, but you actually can turn it off. You don't have to wait till it dies. That power button that turns it on actually turns it off as well. So I would advocate for turning it off every single day, if at all possible. Mm. Um, maybe limiting screen time, having more analog time. And then um, emotionally, I would say doing things like journaling, processing with a friend, obviously with a therapist, if you can get with a therapist, but if not, um, with someone safe who you can just process your emotions with, cry, dance, sing, run, any any kind of emotional release that's healthy in that season. Beautiful ideas, a lot there. We'll kind of break that down for you in the show notes, but just that you, you did spend time laying this out in your book. And I'm so grateful. I'm often, I mean, seriously, it's one of the main things that I'm helping, uh, especially us high capacity leaders. There's this, there's this belief that somehow comes from our families of origin and our culture. It doesn't come from scripture, um, but that rest is selfish. So as we're winding down, mm -hmm. maybe speak to that voice that uh, men and women both feel mm. of like, I've got to do for the Lord and make the most and live with purpose and be significant and all these things that are good. Um, but that rest is selfish. What would you say to that? Yeah. I'm so glad you asked that because I'm, I get like a little bit bristly. A lot of times when I'll hear um, believers talk about rest and they'll say something along the lines of like, it is selfish, but it's okay to take care of yourself. And I would just say like, selfishness is a sin. Like mm. selfishness is a sin. Being self-centered is, is not who God made us to be. Um, that being said, caring for our bodies, our minds, our spirits, and our emotions is not selfish. Mm. It is not a sin. It's stewardship. We are made in the image of God. So not only do we see our friend and Savior Jesus doing this during his time mm. on earth, but also we can take the lead from our good, kind, compassionate father who cares for us, who comes toward us at just the right time to take care for us. Um, and so I would say knowing your own boundaries and borders, knowing what you need to be renewed, to be recreated, none of those things are selfish. They're actually stewardship. And we mm. cannot continue to live our lives, to give him glory, to serve other people, to show up, to build the kingdom, to bring heaven to earth. If, if we don't take care of our own limitations um, and honor them in the name of Jesus. Amen. So how can people find your book and your resources, Jess, as we close? Well, uh, my website is jessconnelly.com. I'm Jess A. Connolly on social media and tired of being tired should be available. Most places books are sold, but definitely on Amazon. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us. And I am just a, oh, a good word joy. today, a good reminder. And hopefully even just listening brought rest to people to say it's okay to be human. 
Jesus limited himself. Mm -hmm. It's okay to accept our limits and to start moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being with us. My joy. Thank you for having me. So I just had a great conversation with Jess, and I want to continue the conversation about rest. Jess had to jet and go on to her next um, appointment. But I wanted to just point out a few things that she was saying that I think are really important to reiterate and maybe um, kind of draw out some application. She was talking about how Jesus so often um, was modeling limits. There is so much. Jesus was both God and human. He was God in a bod. And in his love, um, he joined us in our humanity and came as a baby, lived as a man all the way through 33 years old, and did all the things that a man would go through minus getting married. Um, But he, there was this uh, process that you would see throughout scripture where he was showing up and being very fully present with the hurting, the marginalized. He was teaching and preaching. He was discipling. Um, And so he's doing all these things as a leader. He's like the ultimate leader, the best leader. He's also very trauma-informed. That's a whole other talk. But the other thing we see is that he pulls away. And Jess is alluding to the, the many times in scripture where we see that Jesus actually pulls away to go be with his father in heaven to be able to have some time of silence and solitude. And that is a rhythm that very few of us know how to practice and put into place in a very noisy world. In fact, think about the last time you just sat in silence. My guess is, is that when you get in the car, you've got the radio on, a podcast. Um, When you are in home, there's chatter going on from the family. There's um, always TV going on. The media is constant in our lives. In fact, I think the average American at this point is watching or is consuming nine hours of digital content a day. Nine hours. So think about that. It's overwhelming to think about how much noise and constant information we have coming at us that we're receiving. And then we also have other things. We have to do things. Um, And so when you think about how Jesus was intentional about pulling away and having time to really just be quiet, to pray, I imagine that he journaled, but we don't know that for sure. But this idea that he's having communion, connection with God the Father to be able to refresh. And what he says is to know what is his business, his father's business. So when he comes back to do his work, he knows what his assignment is and he doesn't get distracted by all the voices and expectations around. And there are a lot of expectations coming at us. If you're a leader of any sort, if you're a parent in the home, you've got expectations of yourself of your in-laws, of your parents, your children, your children's friends, parents, uh, the teachers, everyone around you has expectations. And then if you're a leader of any sort of, uh, you know, company or ministry, you have the expectations of all your followers, your colleagues. It's constant. So to be able to pull away and to have some time of silence and solitude with God the Father and to hear his voice and to recognize what is my assignment? His expectation is pretty simple, and that is just to have relationship. He wants us to to experience being known by him. He knows us. And then knowing him and having really healthy attachment and then being able to go out into the world and to offer that to others. And how we do that shows up in our different CVIs and the way that we do that. But one of the things that is just really important of what she said and what she writes about in her book, Tired of Being Tired, and others that are speaking to into the community right now with lots of books about uh, rest and practices of silence and solitude. It's just this idea that we need to slow down. And I just sat with a client, uh, one of my coaching clients, a really beautiful leader who um, is phenomenal in all of her giftings. And she was here for an intentional uh, leadership retreat. And I sent them all out for some silence and solitude. And here was the challenge. I just want you to spend time, 20 minutes, listening, looking, smelling, tasting, feeling, 20 minutes out in creation and see what God wants to show you. He often speaks in different ways through his creation, through his word, through people. Um, But this time of just quieting ourselves, 
So we were reflecting back on that. And she said, I have never in my life spent any time in silence and heard the birds chirp. Now that might not be new for you, but I imagine that for many, that's a common theme. For her, there was such a profound connection between hearing the birds chirp and then this idea that God cares even for the birds and the lilies and that you don't have to worry about anything because he's taking care of them. He's going to take care of you. And how God in that moment, as she sat and just was present, he was able to speak that to her and her soul found a deeper sense of rest that she's carried back into her leadership. So this is my just thought that I want to think about um, as we end this time of talking about tired of being tired and finding rhythms of rest. This is a lot of what we do in our wholehearted leadership process, in our counseling, in our coaching. Sometimes we're finding that there's a lot of interference and being stuck, and that's what our counselors are doing, and that's what I spend a lot of years helping with trauma and cleaning out. Um, our bodies actually are hyper vigilant and run on high levels of intensity. Think about running from a bear and trying to survive. Uh, you're sprinting in a life and death situation. When we have trauma, our bodies learn that that's normal. And taking that into the rest of our world is actually part of what's causing harm and interference and learning how to be quiet and so in silence and solitude. So in the counseling world, that's really what we're helping with is, is really learning how to commune and attach and to clean out some of the things in our story. And on the coaching side, we're helping you with simple practices like this and saying, let's, let's slow down. Let's try this. Let's figure out where you're at in your life, what your leadership looks like, the stage of life in your family, and what might provide some physical rest, soul rest, emotional rest, and, um, did I say physical? Spiritual rest. So being able to come alongside you is a gift that we have. So if you want to grow in this area, we have a sabbatical coach. Uh, her name is Rhonda Beacon, Rhonda at Living Wholehearted. She specializes in coming alongside ministry leaders who are taking a sabbatical and then also learning how to develop rhythms of rest in your own leadership and in your communities, in your leadership wakes. And then we all as coaches and counselors are wanting to help you uh, really find joy um, because at the end of the day, we're all tired of being tired. So Jesus came to give life and give it abundantly. And we're here to help you do that. And so until next time, continue to lean in, to continue to keep growing and becoming the leader that you would follow. Well, did you know that we're not just podcasters? One of the best ways to connect with Tara and I and our whole team at Living Wholehearted is our website, livingwholehearted.com. There you're going to find the books that we've written, our e-courses, executive coaching, organizational development, and professional counseling services. And then one of our favorite things that we're up to these days, our Wholehearted Leadership Cohorts, where we take groups of leaders for one to two year journeys together. It's amazing. While you're there, for fresh content, make sure that you sign up for our e-newsletter. That's where we're putting out stuff every month that you want to keep close with. So visit livingwholehearted.com. You can also join us on socials at living underscore wholehearted on Instagram, and we are living wholehearted on Facebook. You can also follow me at Tara Matson on Instagram. We love to engage with you personally there, so make sure you reach out. Leave us a review if you're enjoying this podcast. Hey, thank you for caring about being the kind of person and leader that lives with integrity. 